to Hong Kong. Icon disconnected. Ready to pair. Connected to Icon. If there's any relationship between guilt and gold, that the love of money is the root of evil. I wonder often if there's any relationship between guilt and gold, that the love of money is the root of evil. It's a very true saying. Because you see, the difference between having a job and having a vocation is that a job is some unpleasant work you do in order to make money. with the sole purpose of making money. And uh, there are plenty of jobs because there is still a certain amount of dirty work that nobody wants to do and that therefore they will pay someone to do it. There is essentially less and less of that kind of work because of mechanization. But if you do a job with the sole purpose of making money, you are absurd. Because if money becomes the goal, and it does when you work that way, you begin increasingly to confuse it with happiness or with pleasure. Yes, one can take a whole handful of crisp dollar bills and practically water your mouth over. But this is as kind of a person who is confused, like a Pavlov dog, who salivates on the wrong bill. Y'all doing up so late? That's what I want to know. Why your ass up right now? It goes back, you see, to the ancient guilt that if you don't work, you have no right to eat. That if there are others in the world who don't have enough to eat, you shouldn't enjoy your dinner, even though you have no possible means of conveying the food to them.
And uh, while it is true that we are all one human family, and that every individual involves every other individual, while it is true, therefore, we should do something about changing the situation, the one way of not doing anything about a situation is feeling guilty about it. Because when people feel guilty about a situation, they you, most usually, instead of doing something practical to change it, they resort to all sorts of symbolic methods of expiation. They go to confession. Uh, they uh, see an animus. They uh, do all kinds of things. <coughs> ways of actually not doing anything about the problem. But feeling all right about it instead. And guilt invariably produces that sort of reaction. Instead, uh, we, we need to have a different attitude to our mistakes and to our misdeeds. Walt Whitman always admired animals because they do not lie awake at night and weep for their sins. Our animals are practical in the real sense, as our children who haven't been taught uh, this extraordinary uh, hang up of guilt. Because if you have done something wrong and you have made a mistake and somebody makes you ashamed of it and guilty, you run around licking the sores of your wounded ego because you feel your pride is find, for example, in Japan, the Japanese have a terrible hang-up about making mistakes. They, uh, therefore, never have the courage to practice their English properly. They've had seven years of English in school, most of it very, very badly taught, and it's irrelevant English. They learn uh, all about Shakespeare and uh, Dickens and uh, Thackeray and uh, Thomas Hardy and so on, and therefore they can't carry on an everyday conversation. So they are ashamed to try out their English unless drunk. So if you want to get into conversation with the Japanese in English, you have to go to bars. And then they say university students and so on there will loosen up and talk. <clears throat> because they no longer have the inhibition, the shame of saying the wrong thing.
So likewise, I know a very great anthropologist who was taught music, playing the piano in the same way I was. When I was taught music, uh, the school mom who taught me used to put an India rubber, an eraser it's called in this country, on the top of each hand so that I would have my hands in good posture. And every time I'd play a wrong note, she'd hit my fingers with a pencil. And this great anthropologist had had a similar sort of uh, True. musical education. You know it. And when confronted with the piano, but I want to know <clears throat> marvelous teacher in San Francisco. The thing that I want to know is how do you know who the fuck Alan Watts is? Cause that makes you a little bit special. I'm not saying you better than everybody. I'm not saying you're more intelligent than everybody because you know who Alan Watts is. I'm not saying you have a better intuition, but all these things are plausible, you know? All these things must be brought into consideration when a person actually knows who Alan Watts is. So, I give you 10 cool points for that. You know, 10 cool points. He said she was a maid. He was completely incapable of reading notes. So, uh, another great uh, teacher of the piano I knew said simply, you must not be afraid of playing wrong notes. Uh, just uh, forget it. Uh, play it wrong. And then uh, eventually go over it again and uh, you'll eventually get it right. But you must not block. Uh, always keep the same rhythm going. Even if you have to slow it down but keep the proportionate rhythm of one note to another. And if it's the wrong note, play the wrong note, as long as you play something in the right rhythm. <laughs> so, you know, this is a way of taking away people's guilt and shame about making mistakes. So, you absolutely, freedom means, basically, the freedom to make mistakes. The freedom to be a damn fool. And then not to recriminate with yourself when you do finally realize that it was a mistake, but simply don't do it again. Or at least do it less often. <laughs>
And one of the reasons that our technology is impeded and prevented from feeding the world properly is the failure of one of our networks. It's an information network and it's called money. About which we have psychological plots which have been gone into at some length by Freud who equates our valuation of money with our attitude to excrement Money and our psychological attitude to money uh, is a major obstacle to a proper development of technology, enabling it to do what it is supposed to do, that is, to save labor and to produce goods, services, and so on adequately. So I must introduce this with a story which is entirely legendary indeed quite apocryphal. The great banks of the world at one time got absolutely sick of the expense and security measures involved in shipping consignments of gold from one bank to another. And so they decided that all the chief banks of the world would open uh, offices on a certain island in the South Pacific, which was balmy and comfortable. And there they would store all the gold in the world. And they put it in great subterranean vaults reached by deep elevator shafts. And uh, then all they had to do when one bank or one country owed gold to another was to trundle it across the street. And this was very efficient. And it went on beautifully for five or six years. And then the presidents of the World Banks got together and said, let's have a convention out on this island and take our wives and families. So. All those presidents and their wives and families went out to this specific island, and they inspected the books, and everything was beautifully in order. And the children said, oh, Daddy, can't we see the gold? They said, of course you may see the gold. And they said to the managers, let's take our children down to the vaults and show them the gold. And the managers said, well, um, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit inconvenient at this time. And, uh, perhaps the children would uh, uh, not really be very interested. Our promise just don't know the plain gold. And the, man, and the president said, no, 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 come now, uh, they'd be thrilled, but let's, let's go down and see. Finally, it came out that uh, a few years before, there had been a catastrophic subterranean earthquake, and all the vaults had been swallowed up, and all the gold had disappeared. But so far as the bookkeeping was concerned, everything was in perfect order. Uh, <clears throat> my standard size canvas is an 18 by 24 inch canvas, 
and my starting price is 400 bucks for a single person portrait. So those are <coughs> this size cameras right here, 18 by 24. I'll give you a comparison to the one I'm working on now. This is a, I'm working on a 24 by 36. So it's actually double. It's, it's double the size of the 18 by 24 inch canvas. Yeah, so for a canvas that size, a portrait of, of one person normally starts around 400 bucks. Um, it really all depends on the photograph itself, on um, how much detail is going to have to go into the photograph. So uh, I, say, I say 400 bucks, like I say, as a starting point, but an average painting for me is maybe like 600 Um that's including like shipping and stuff because you have to pay for your own shipping. So, but this is a commission right here for uh, uh, this young lady is from New York and she's having this done just as a, you know, a gift to herself. I just recently finished two commissions, uh, sent those to uh, Virginia a couple weeks ago. I sent a piece to uh berlin like two weeks ago there's a fucking mat in here shit so yeah <clears throat> it's real easy bro you can um all my uh social media you can contact me on facebook instagram and twitter at paintings by the prince my last name is really prince And I make paintings, so it's kind of obvious. Just hit me up at Paintings by the Prince. And uh, you can communicate there. Or if you're on PlayStation Network, you can send me a friend request here. And um, send me some pictures of some things you're thinking about getting done. And... And uh, we'll get some projects put together if you really want something. Uh, I put her downstairs. I actually, I actually cleaned up a lot in here, and I took a. Like, I had, like, two or three stacks of paintings over here, and I kind of moved a lot of stuff and um, and put it downstairs just because it was getting kind of cramped in here. So, yeah, Granny with the pistol, uh, reading, a, reading a Bible and smoking a cigarette. Yo, Granny is not to be fucked with, yo. <laughs> Damn. Yo, a lot, of, a lot of people like that paint. There's a print right there. That's the one you're talking about. That's a, a little poster I had made for uh, one of my shows, one of my solo shows, and uh, that she was the uh, the feature piece. But the the painting itself isn't in here right now. It's all good. I get that for for a, a, a while, yo. Like people try to figure me out. And they'll watch for a minute, like, I can't figure out if this dude is cool or if he's a fucking a weirdo or what. Then after a while, people are like, ah, oh, yeah, all right, might as well say something to this motherfucker. <laughs> but yeah, <clears throat> that granny with the pistol, I actually painted her and her, her daughter. I painted her daughter with a gun as well. I, I took uh, both photos the same day, and I just had my, my, uh, my prop guns with me. And so the mom had the pistol, and I had the daughter with the uh, assault rifle. Have you ever Have you ever seen that one? The uh, the black girl with the assault rifle, and she has a mask. This um, <laughs> that's what it is, bro. You gotta be careful, man, cause there's so many fucking trolls out there, yo. I swear, motherfuckers are just hate on you and fuck with you for no reason, yo. No reason other than 
they they too um insecure to stream, you know what I'm saying? It's an old one. It's a real old one. Let me go I'll grab it for you real quick. I think I think that one is uh in the living room. I'm trying not to make too much noise, my girl, my girl sleep. <laughs> Uh, what this means, then, is <laughs> that money is nothing but bookkeeping. It is figures. It is a way of measuring what you owe the community yeah, this and what is... the community owes you. It is, of course, as you all know, a substitute for barter. Oh, that's what's up, yeah. If you worked on a farm and the farmer yeah, this paid is, you in uh, terms of years of corn, onions, cabbages, and uh, other vegetables, and yet you wanted a pot and pan of some kind, and you took a few vegetables over to the man, and so he made pots and pans and he swapped. Uh, some people use uh, curry shells to stand for money so that you wouldn't have to barter. Yeah, carry around all these inconvenient loads of, uh, of goods. Oh, and that's then, why I uh, of course, gold was used. That's why I had there. to get him from out of here, man. He's just because sitting here so just collecting dust. I need to clean them off and get them hung up somewhere else or do something uh, with these motherfuckers. I got too much fucking art sitting around here. The answer is a mystery called credit. Credit is for people. And uh, as the economy of the Western world developed, it was found that there was not enough gold around if it were to remain constant in value, to exchange goods and services. Yeah, they crazy. <laughs> and this is a uh, daughter. of goods and services to uh, keep pace with the amount of gold in circulation. But nobody will ever put down the price. There's something in our psychology whereby prices always tend to go up. But at the same time, because yeah, the, the yeah, amount of gold in the world did not the provide an adequate channel yeah. for the circulation of goods and services, uh, yeah, uh, when people can afford it. Industrial nations, when <laughs> this is a uh, this is a commission right here. They created a thing called the national debt, which year so, by year gets bigger and bigger and bigger. This is almost uh, finished being paid for already. So as soon as this is done, but the reason um, for the increase she's from New York, so this would be obvious. getting shipped off to New York as soon as I'm done with it. Uh, my art and needs to be more and more. My, my commissions are a lot cheaper than my own personal art. So, yeah, I can do these for like, you know, less than a grand. But my own art, you're not, you're not going to hardly be able to buy any of my original paintings 
for less than a thousand dollars because I had to conceptualize, envision, um, you know, and then physically put together these scenes, get these two people together in the same place, get the, the props and everything set up how I want it, take the photograph and print it out. So there's a lot more that goes into the creative process of my own art. And I feel like that part has just as much value as the physical part of painting. Because actually, when you buy art, when you buy a painting, you're not just buying the image. Okay, this is a painting of some black dude with dreads. But it's the idea. Someone had to think of it. Someone had to think of this image. You know, so you're buying a conceptual idea that the artist is trying to convey that gives you a certain emotional response or reaction to the image itself. And that is more valuable than the actual physical part of painting. So my own artwork, my own ideas are very expensive. <laughs> so, yeah, I can sell I can sell you a painting like this for, you know, six, seven hundred bucks. Or if you want one of these, this right here is listed at forty five hundred dollars. Uh, no, this is listed at $5,500, I think, you know, something like that right there. It costs you $2,800. But that is, if you wanted these right here, I think these right here are like $1,500 $1, a piece because I have uh, three different pieces for this series. So that's the, that's the only difference. So, yeah, when people want to buy my own art, yeah, I sell my own art if you can afford it. Is my shit's not cheap and it's never going to be cheap or well it's not i think my art is cheap when you look at other artists who can sell paintings for fifteen thousand twenty thousand thirty five thousand dollars you know i'm saying if you want a piece of mine for like three three grand i think that's a reasonable price for uh the level of art that i'm creating right now yeah yeah so there's so there's a whole uh, thing about how we weren't able to build up wealth anyway, <laughs> you know, because I'm black and I'm from South Carolina. So I already know what you're talking about, bruh. But that's another thing that I, I, I was always taught by my mentor. Never short yourself. Never shortchange yourself on your art and set yourself a standard so that people respect your art. You know what I'm saying? And so if you don't want to give me what I want for it, then cool, I'll keep it. <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not in a rush to sell none of this stuff. I don't I don't do this just for money, yo. I do this because I enjoy painting. I like to paint. I'm a painter, you know. I love doing this shit. If I turn this camera off right now, I'll still be in here fucking painting. And nobody's paying me to do it. Well, for this piece I'm getting paid to do it. But like I say, you know. If I don't if I don't sell this art, that shit don't bother me. Uh, I plan on leaving behind a great, great collection. You know what I'm saying? When I when I leave this earth, I'm gonna leave behind a really good collection of art that's gonna be my fucking legacy. And that shit has to mean something. It has to be inspirational. It has to have real value, not a monetary value. You know what I'm saying? It has to have Something that will be able to spark some kind of thought or emotional reaction in the young black youth who view my art. That's that's my goal. If I can sell it, that's a plus. You know what I'm saying? That's a plus. If I can't sell it, oh well. I know what I'm still doing. You know what I'm saying? I know why, why I'm doing this shit. My IG is paintings with an S. Paintings by the Prince. Easy to remember. Paintings by the Prince. Yo, Westside, that's what's up, man. 
know what I'm saying? That and encouragement is is once again there's a there's a lot of things that's more important to me than money. I swear to God, money is not my end all be all. Just having, you know, positive people around, that's way more valuable than money. Getting getting awesome compliments, that's way more valuable than money. Encouragement, you know what I'm saying? Being inspired. And when I can find people that inspire me and give me that source of inspiration, that's way more valuable than money. You know what I'm saying? Just motherfuckers can't afford my art. That don't mean shit. They still add to my life in a more dynamic way than just some random person saying, yeah, I, I want to buy that painting. Okay. So. Guys, I'm going to, um, I got to grab something to drink. I ain't even going to lie. Y'all fucking cotton mouth is a bitch right now. Throw this sound back on so it ain't so quiet in here. I say my girl sleeps, so I ain't trying to wake her up. Money. Uh, that is to say, tokens of exchange. Tokens of exchange. This whole, this whole money the shit. Of goods produced, you know what I'm saying? Which is ever increasing. Now, I'm not an economist, but any fool can see certain extremely fundamental principles about this whole situation. And I'm speaking of the thought today of a man called Robert Theobald, who sort of ties in with the general picture of people like McLuhan and Buckminster Fuller, in having very far out thoughts and very adventurous thoughts about what we should do about money. And the proposition that he puts forward is very simple. That money is a circulation of information and in itself has no value. Gold, of course, has some value. It has some value for an industry and some value for dentistry and some value for jewelry. as a means of exchanging the goods and services of the world, it is as primitive as uh, post horses for carrying the mail. We must recognize then that money is a pure abstraction. I was on a television show a little while ago with... Um, Ted Sorensen and Raymond Moley. Ted Sorensen. And they were having a long, long discussion, which sounded like something that goes on in a smoke-filled back room of uh, party bosses, where they were talking about the prospects for the Republican Democratic parties in 1968. And then they got onto the question of automation and the problems of unemployment that it was making and the difficulties of transferring workers from this to that when they were only trained for this. Finally, I said, the trouble with you gentlemen is you still think money is real. And they looked at me and sort of said, oh, 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 someone who doesn't think money is real, because every now anybody knows money is money and it's very important. But uh, it just isn't real at all, because it has the same relationship to real wealth, that is to say, to actual goods and services, that words have to meaning, that words have to the physical world. And as words are not the physical world, Money is not wealth. It only is an accounting of available energy, economic energy. Now, what happens then when you introduce technology into production? You produce enormous quantities of goods by technological methods. But at the same time, you put people out of work. 
You can say, oh, but it always creates more jobs. There will always be more jobs. Yes, but they will be, lots of them will be futile jobs. They will be jobs making every kind of frippery and unnecessary contraption. And one will also at the same time have to beguile the public into feeling that they need and want these completely unnecessary things that aren't even beautiful. And therefore an enormous amount of nonsense employment and busy work, bureaucratic and otherwise, has to be created in order to keep people working. Because we believe as good Protestants that the devil finds work for idle hands to do. But the basic principle of the whole thing has been completely overlooked. That the purpose of the machine is to make drudgery unnecessary. And if we don't allow it to achieve its purpose, we live in a constant state of self-frustration. So then if a given manufacturer automates his plant and dismisses his labor force and they have to uh, operate on a very much diminished income, say some sort of dole, the manufacturer suddenly finds that the public does not have the wherewithal to buy his products. And therefore he has invested in this expensive automobile automated machinery to no purpose and therefore obviously uh, the public has to be provided with the means of purchasing what the machines produce now, people say that's not fair where's the money going to come from who's going to pay for it the answer is the machine the machine pays for it because the machine works for the manufacturer and for the community. This is only saying that the government or the people have to be responsible for issuing to themselves sufficient credit to circulate the goods they are producing and have to balance the measuring standard of money with the gross national product. There's communism, he's explaining.
That means that taxation is obsolete, completely obsolete. It ought to go the other way. Theobald points out that every individual should be assured of a minimum income. Now you see that absolutely horrifies most people. Say all these wastrels, these people who uh, are out of job because they're really lazy. See, uh, give them the money. Yeah, because otherwise the machines can't work. It comes with blockage. This was the situation of the Great Depression, when here we were still, in a material sense, a very rich country, with plenty of fields and farms and mines and factories everything going but suddenly because of a psychological hang-up because of a mysterious uh, mumbo jumbo about uh, the, the economy about the banking we were all miserable and poor starving in the midst of plenty just because of a psychological hang-up and that hang-up is that money is real and that uh, people ought to suffer in order to get it but the whole point of the machine is to relieve you of that suffering, which is an ingenuity. You see, we are um, psychologically back in the 17th century and technically in the 20th. And here comes the problem. So, uh, what we have to find out how to do is to change the psychological attitude to money and to wealth and furthermore to pleasure, and furthermore to the nature of work. And this is a formidable problem. It requires the best uh, brains in public relations, in propaganda, in all that kind of thing, in all the media, television, radio, newspapers, everything, to try to get across a message to the vast general public about what money is. You see, the difficulty is this. When the public suspects that the money that is being issued, the dollar bills being issued by the government, are only paper, and stand only for paper, they start putting up prices. So you get an inflationary situation, where the more paper money there is, the higher and higher and higher the prices go. Which is uh, a very stupid psychological maneuver. And people have to be persuaded. Uh, the least effective way of persuading people is passing laws. But they have to be persuaded somehow not to put up the prices, but to play fair with each other and keep some sort of standard correspondence between how much is produced and how much credit is issued. Let's suppose I do this often in vocational guidance of students. They come to me and say, well, uh, we're getting out of college and we have the faintest idea what we want to do. So I always ask the question, what would you like to do if money were no object? How would you really enjoy spending your life? Well, it's so amazing as a result of our kind of educational system, crowds of students say, well, we'd like to be painters, we'd like to be poets, we'd like to be writers, but as everybody knows, you can't earn any money that way. Or another person says, well, I'd like to live an out-of-doors life and ride horses. I say, do you want to teach in a riding school? Uh, let's go through with it. What do you want? When we finally got down to something which the individual says he really wants to do, I will say to him, you do. change the psychological attitude to money and to wealth and furthermore to pleasure and furthermore to the nature of work and this is a formidable problem it requires the best 
uh, brains in public relations, in propaganda, in all that kind of thing, and, and all the media, television, radio, whatever, whatever, whatever. newspapers, everything, to try to get across a message to the vast general public about what money is. You see, the difficulty is this. When the public suspects that the money that is being issued, the dollar bills being issued by the government, are only paper, and stand only for paper, they start putting up prices. So you get an inflationary situation, where the more paper money there is, the higher and higher and higher the prices go. Which is uh, a very stupid psychological maneuver. And people have to be persuaded. Uh, the least effective way of persuading people is passing laws. But they have to be persuaded somehow not to put up the prices, but to play fair with each other and keep some sort of standard correspondence between how much is produced and how much credit is issued. Let's suppose I do this often in vocational guidance for students. They come to me and say, well, uh, we're getting out of college and we haven't the faintest idea what we want to do. So I always ask the question, what would you like to do if money were no object? How would you really enjoy spending your life? Well, it's so amazing as a result of our kind of educational system, crowds of students say, well, we'd like to be painters, we'd like to be poets, we'd like to be writers. But is every That's the first thing, right? We'd like to be painters. If money was no object, that probably would have been my first answer. I just want to paint. If I can just, if I don't have to worry about paying bills and where my meals is coming from, I ain't got to worry about shit. I'm just painting all the time. Fuck that. Everybody <laughs> knows you can't earn any money that way. Or another person says, well, I'd like to live an out-of-doors life and ride horses. I say, do you want to teach in a riding school? Uh, let's go through with it. What do you want to do? When we finally got down to something which the individual says he really wants to do, I will say to him, you do that. And uh, forget the money. Uh, because if you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you will spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. And after all, if you do really like what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, you can eventually turn it, uh, you can eventually become a master of it. The only way to become a master of something is really with it. And then you'll be able to get a good fee for whatever it is. So uh, don't, don't worry too much. That, that's uh, everybody's, uh, somebody's interested in everything. And anything you could be interested in, you'll find others. In. But it's absolutely stupid. Spend your time doing things you don't like in order to go on spending things you don't like and doing things you don't like and to teach your children to follow the same track. See, what we're doing is we're bringing up children to educate them to live the same sort of lives we're living in order that uh, they may justify themselves and find satisfaction in life by bringing up their children, to bring up their children to do the same thing. So it's all wretch and no vomit. It never gets there. And so, therefore, it's so important to consider this question. What do I desire? Well, when we answer that question in a naive way, 
we figure out that we want a desire, uh, well, what we want is to control it, to create girls that don't grow old, apples that don't rot, clothes that never wear out, conveyances that get from one place to another instantly so we don't have to wait, power available to do anything that you could conceive and do it just instantly like that, to get this funny technological omnipotence. But if you take time out to think about that and really go into it with your full strength of imagination, and find out whether that's where you want to be, you will soon see that's not what you want. The moment you have a situation where you are really in control of things, that is to say in which the future is almost completely predictable. You will see, as I said last night, that a completely predictable future is already the past. You've had it. That's not what you want. You want a surprise. that's going to be, because obviously it wouldn't be a surprise if you did. You want a pleasant surprise. Oh yeah. But like you say, what sort of a surprise would be pleasant? You can't really answer. You shall see the revelation. Because you know, if there are to be such things as pleasant surprises, there must also be unpleasant surprises. There must be rude shocks. like somebody taking a, one of those wishing well boxes, you know, tubs, you know, where you fish in and you bring out a package. You don't know whether you've got a dead rat in it or a new camera. <laughs> hey, Mexico just had an earthquake. way that's that seems to be the thing that really excites people but quite certainly there comes out of this inquiry a feeling of real disillusionment with the ideal of power to be in power to be in control is not something that any sensible person wants imagine the situation of big brother mr J. Edgar Hoover, Heinrich Himmler. To be glued day and night to a highly defended office with telephones, television screens, watching, peeking, spying, getting all this information together. Why? You could never leave the office. I mean, the people character, I suppose, like here, the Hoover goes home in the evening, and, uh, but when he's back home, you know, there are guards sitting outside the door, there's a hotline telephone going to something, uh, he's always having to be in control, Same old shit, bro. and he can't take any time off, he can't, uh, go for a walk in the park with a friend, or go instantly to the movies, or sit down, and, uh, just relax, have an undistracted party in the baths and big surf. Yeah, hey, what a pauper this guy is. Completely deprived. Because he wants to be in control, because he wants power. People are frustrated in love. 
we feel jilted, there's a natural tendency in a human being to seek power as a substitute. And that's a, a very negative thing. It's like having a bad temper. To seek power after you're frustrated in love, you should try and get back on the love beam. Because nobody wants power. Now, you may say that's shirking responsibility. That if you were a really responsible person, you would go out for power and try to use power to the best possible advantage for the benefit of all. Really, YouTube? Is it that? Is it that fucking serious? Is it that serious? Where he would just not play it, bro? So disappointed in you right now, YouTube. So disappointed. Oh, why? Why do you have to stop? Not enough connection. Connected to iPhone. You better be connected to my iPhone. For real. Come on, YouTube. Connected to Galaxy Tab A2016, Galaxy Tab A2016, disconnected. Connected to Galaxy Tab A2016 and iPhone, Galaxy Tab A2016, disconnected. not gonna click this crazy shit sorry yeah sorry that shit is crazy word to mother oh well GPS Wi Fi.
you don't like that awkward silence? Yeah. It is what it is, bro. That meditation time.
What up, man? Y'all some y'all some chill motherfuckers, just all chill and quiet and shit. You know? I like that. This shit right here. Oh my god. That's some good shit right there, bro. I ain't even gonna lie. That is a good beverage.
Yeah, no? Yo. What up, yo? Kaka. Isn't that Russian for shit? Shit. Say it look like caca. I like the pico. Pico. What is pico? I like the Pico. Yo, Robert. That's what's up. Try to fight that glare. That shit looking pretty damn good, right? Oh, snap. Your boy got it going on. <sighs> Ballin'. Connected to ICOM. Auto gravity. This is awesome. I would buy cars every week. It's so important to consider this question. What do I desire? When we answer that question in a naive way, we figure out that we want a desire, uh, what we want is to control everything. To create girls that don't grow old, apples that don't rot, clothes that never wear out, conveyances that get from one place to another instantly so we don't have to wait, power available to do anything that you could conceive and do it just instantly like that. 
get this funny technological omnipotence. But if you take time out to think about that, and really go into it with your full strength of imagination, and find out whether that's where you want to be, you will soon see that's not what you want. The moment you have a situation where you are really in control of things, that is to say in which the future is almost completely predictable. You will see, as I said last night, that a completely predictable future is already the past. You've had it. That's not what you want. You want a surprise. You don't know what that's going to be, because obviously it wouldn't be a surprise if you did. want a pleasant surprise. But like you say, what sort of a surprise would be pleasant? You can't really answer. Because you know, if there are to be such things as pleasant surprises, there must also be unpleasant surprises. There must be rude shocks. So you're like somebody taking a, one of those wishing well boxes, you know, tubs, you know, where you fish in and you bring out a package. You don't know whether you've got a dead rat in it or a new camera. <laughs> And that's the way, that's, that seems to be the thing that really excites people. But quite suddenly there comes out of this inquiry a feeling of real disillusionment with the ideal of power. To be in power, to be in control, is not something that any sensible person wants. Imagine the situation of Big Brother. Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, Heinrich Himmler, to be glued day and night to a highly... This is about as much as I can do right now. It's all wet now. So we're going to have to let this dry for a little while before I can work on the dress. Cause... Watch him. Peaking. Spying. Uh -huh. Getting all this information together. Why? You could never leave the office. Yeah, the dress is still pretty wet, so it's going to have to go through another day or so of drying before I can work on it any further. So while this is drying, I'll just work on another piece. And he can't take any time off. He can't go for a walk in the park with a friend. Or go inside of the movie. I'm working on this as well. Have an undistracted party in the bar for Big Sir. Yeah, hey, what a pauper this guy is. Completely so to work on this for a little while. Because he wants to be in control, because he wants power. People are frustrated in love. Because you're jilted. There's a natural tendency in a human being to seek power as a substitute. And that's a, a very negative thing, it's like having a bad temper. To seek power after you're frustrated with love, you should try and get back on the love beat. Because nobody wants power. Now you may say that's shirking responsibility. That if you were a really responsible person, 
you would go out for power and try to use power to the best possible advantage for the benefit of all. All right, what would be the benefit of all? Ask them. What do you want me to do with this power? I'm dictator. What would you like me to do? Well, nobody knows, because they haven't thought it through. They think of all sorts of short-range things, and they are largely conflicting and confused, because they're not well thought out. But again, when it finally comes down to it, nobody wants to be God. Now then, when uh, Oriental philosophy and religion was first introduced to the Western world, it was introduced under the auspices of people who were fascinated with power. The fringy fair. It was introduced in the latter part of the 19th century, when we had heard all about evolution and how the human race was going on to ever greater heights, and we would eventually develop Superman according to Nietzsche. And uh, H.G. Wells, remember all that early fantasy of where evolution would lead through the development of technology. And so at this time, people like H.P. Blavatsky were talking about the mysterious wisdom of the East. And they raised it, they amended it to us. that there was psychic technology. That there was something that you could go way beyond anything that could be done through the physical sciences. You could cause your physical body to disintegrate to another level of vibration, and then transmit it and reassemble it somewhere else. You could live as long as you like because you control the fundamental processes. You could determine if you decided to die, where you would be reborn, exactly. You would be a complete master of life. Uh, Charlotte and Love Sang Rampa, who uh, writes about uh, Tibetan mastery. People read that because uh, they, they think that there may be a way of beating the game. So, therefore, the wise men of Asia were represented through this kind of propaganda as masters of life. As, for example, people whose emotions didn't bother them, who could put up with any amount of pain by simply turning off their feelings, who could foretell the future, who could read your thoughts, and who were above all kinds of ordinary human frailty. Well, when I first met Buddhist priests, Zen masters, swamis, all these wise men from the East. 
One of the first things that impressed itself upon me was that they were perfectly ordinary human beings. They had bad tempers. They were fussy about certain things. They uh, just acted as I would expect human beings to act. And so at first I was very disappointed. I thought they had feet of clay. That they didn't come up to these promises of psychotechnology. But after a while, I got to realize why not, that they had already thought all that through. of this kind in Sanskrit are called Siddhi, S-I-D-D-H-I. But there is hardly one decent scripture or text on yoga that does not say again and again, if you get Siddhi, ignore it. Go on to something else. These are only the foothills. These are, furthermore, not only foothills, but they are seductive, blind alleys. Won't take you anywhere at all. Now, I think that this is the greatest possible lesson for the Western world to learn, because we are so hung up on the idea of power, of control, of being able to make everything go the right way. Supposing I have, uh, I'm an alchemist. I have a whole secret closet full of love for you. Very full of love. If I see a desirable woman, all I have to do is to offer her a cigarette or give her a glass of wine with one of my secret potions in it. And instantly, I'm a master. all I've got again is that plastic doll that when I push it, it does what I tell it to. That doesn't have any effect. What you always are looking for in things is where the surprise is there. <laughs> 
where there's a comeback and you say my god this thing is alive it has a will of its own it is not in my control and i would like to have a relationship with something like that because it would never be dull Therefore, these Zen Buddhist masters that I met and others what up, guys? were not super occultists. And very many Westerners who visited Japan expecting to get a uh, Satori as a result of which they would know everything and control everything were grievously disappointed and said there's not much in this after all. You're not victims of a scheme of things, of a mechanical world, or of an autocratic god. The life you're living is what you have put yourself into. Only you don't admit it, because you want to play the game that it's happened to you. In other words, I got mixed up in this world. My parents, I had a father who got a hot pants over a girl and she was my mother and uh, he was just a horny old man and as a result of that I got born and I blame him for it and say well that's your fault you've got to look after me and he says I don't see why I should look after you you're just a result <laughs> but let's suppose we admit that I really wanted to get born. And that I was the ugly gleam in my father's eye when he approached my mother. That was me. What's up? I was desired. And I deliberately got involved. And that even if I got myself into an awful mess, and I got born with syphilis and the great Siberian itch and tuberculosis and uh, in the Nazi concentration camp. Nevertheless, this was Cigarettes. a game which was a very far out it's play. A cigarette. It was a kind of cosmic masochism. But I did it. Isn't that an optimal game rule for life? 
as if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved. Or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk and that we really ought to do something about it and uh, so on. <laughs> it's a fact. some somewhat larger brushes for this open area right here. <laughs> Can he say I'm good? Really and truly we are so, all in a state of total bliss and delight. Yeah, I was I was just using these two brushes on that last canvas. And I'm going to these brushes. So these are non bliss in all you know, considerably larger. Bliss. And you can go as far out as non bliss. They're not really big go. brushes though. And when you wake up it'll be great. You know, you can slam yourself on the head front, with a hammer because it's around. nice when you stop. And it makes you realize, you see, how great things are. When you forget that that's the way it is. And that's just like black and white. You don't know black unless you know white. You don't know white unless you know black. It's simply fundamental. So then, my metaphysics, let me be perfectly frank with you, are that there is the central self. You can call it God. You can call it anything you like. And it's all of us. It's playing all the parts of all beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farthest out adventures. But in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you're ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of <laughs> flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume you, maybe you are not serious but sincere that you are ready to wake up. So then, when you're in the way of waking up and finding out who you really are, you meet a character called a guru. As the Hindus say, this word, the teacher, the awakener. And what is the function of a guru? He's the man who looks at you in the eye. And says, oh, come on. <laughs> I know who you are. You know, you come to the guru and say, sir, I have a problem. I'm unhappy and I want to get one up on the universe, so I want to become enlightened. I want spiritual wisdom. Ah, and the guru looks at you and says, Who are you?
You know Sri Ramana Maharshi, that great Hindu sage of modern times? People used to come to him and say, Master, who was I in my last incarnation? He would say, who is asking the question? And he'd look at you and say, basically, go right down to it. You're looking at me, you're looking out, and you're unaware of what's behind your eyes. Go back in and find out who you are, where the question comes from. And if you looked at a photograph of that man, I have a gorgeous photograph of him. And you look in those, I walk by it every time I go out of the front door. And I look at those eyes and the humor. The lilting laugh that says, oh, come on, this man. <laughs> Shiva, I recognize you. When you come to my door and you say, I'm so-and-so, I say, ha ha, what a funny way God has come on today. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of tricks, of course, that gurus play. They uh, say, well, we're going to put you through the mill. And the reason they do that is simply that you won't wake up until you feel you've paid a price for it. In other words, the sense of guilt that one has or the sense of anxiety is simply the way one experiences keeping the game of disguise going on. Do you see that? Supposing you say, I feel guilty. Christianity makes you feel guilty for existing. That somehow, to the very fact that you exist is an affront. You are a fallen human being. I remember as a child when we went to the services of the church on Good Friday, they gave us each a colored postcard with Jesus crucified on it. And it said underneath, this have I done for thee. What doest thou for me? You know, you felt awful. You nailed that man to the cross. You have crucified Christ.
not so many funny associations attached to it that most of us have bought it. When people say, God the Father Almighty, most people feel funny inside. So we like to hear new words. We like to hear about Tao, about Brahma, about uh, Shinyo, and uh, Tathata, and such strange names from the Far East because they don't carry the same associations of mawkish sanctimony and funny meanings from the past. And actually, some of these words that the Buddhists used for the basic energy of the world really don't mean anything at all. The word tathata, uh, which is translated in, from the Sanskrit into suchness or thusness or something like that, uh, really means something more like dadada, -da -da, based on the word tat, which in Sanskrit means that. And so in Sanskrit it is said, tat dvam asi, that thou art, or in modern American, you're it. But da, da, that's the first sound a baby makes when it comes into the world. Because the baby looks around and says, da, 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 that. And fathers flatter themselves and think it's saying da, da, which means daddy. But according to Buddhist philosophy, all this universe is one da, da, da. That means 10,000 functions or 10,000 things, one suchness. And we're all one suchness. And that means that suchness comes and goes like everything else because this whole world is an on and off system. As the Chinese say, it's the yang and the yin. And therefore it consists of now you see it, now you don't. Here you are, here you aren't. Because that's the very nature of energy, to be like waves, and waves have crests and troughs. Only, we, under, being under a certain kind of sleepiness or illusion, imagine that uh, the trough is going to overcome the wave, or the crest. The yin, the dark principle, is going to overcome the yang, or the light principle and that off is finally going to triumph over on. Gee, supposing darkness did win out, wouldn't that be terrible? And so we're constantly trembling and thinking that it may, because after all, isn't it odd that anything exists? It's most peculiar, it requ requires effort, it requires energy, and it would be so much easier for there to have been nothing at all. Therefore we think, well, since being, since the is side of things is so much effort, you always give up after a while and you sink back into death. But death is just the other face of energy. And it's the rest, the not being anything around, that produces something around, just in the same way that you can't have solid without space, or space without solid. When you wake up to this, you are relieved of fundamental terror. That doesn't mean that you're always going to be a great hero, that you won't jump when you hear it bang, that you won't worry occasionally, that you won't lose your temper. It means, though, that fundamentally, deep, deep down within you, you will be able to be human, enlightened men and women, in the pains, difficulties, and struggles that naturally go with human existence.
Yo, that second beat right there. Yo, that shit was too nice, yo. <laughs> Damn. I can't get right back to the Oh, you ain't know? With state of the art, stuff. You know? Yeah, I was trying to get back to the front of this beat right here, yo. This beat too smooth. Beast mode of tank, yo. Oh, yeah. I'm the freshest motherfucker, you know. Nigga, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm the freshest motherfucker, you know. Nigga, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah.
Got a new fan, guys. <clears throat> hey, Ty. Hey, Ty. How you doing, Ty? this one for a couple months but I've had other projects come up in between like the one with the circles that's a commission so I, I started this painting before I started that one but I got to get that one done because someone is actually paying me to do it so this always gets put to the side it's um might be one of them. Alright, pizza. Catch you next time. I might get off in a minute. Oh man, I've been here for two and a half hours. Yo, it's like three something in the morning, yo. Yo, it is. It's three, yo, it's three o'clock in the morning. Holy fuck. I'm gonna have to go back to sleep, guys, because uh in three more hours. That's a shoe size. Yeah, in, in three more hours, yo, the fucking uh, PVP open beta for Ghost Recon Wildlands is gonna pop off. So I gotta get a couple hours of sleep so I can get up and, and play that shit.
Okay, guys. Okay. Okay, let's cut this shit out, though. Move my fucking... I have to fucking put people on punishment in this shit, man. Motherfucking block motherfuckers for a little while or something. Given talent, and that's really actual. It's factual. I gotta use this. I can't abuse this. I gotta do this. Let's stop all the frustration. Trap house entertainment, art, and education. Man, we need to contemplate new situations to make the nation great again. A great for the first time. Yeah, I did it since my first rhyme. Man, I freeze out a million times. Uh, <laughs> and Holland had a million dimes. Did this shit a million rhymes. Yeah. And if a picture worth a thousand words, I paint a million times. Yeah. I paint a million times. Trap us entertainment, art and education. Art and education. Art and education, trap us entertainment, art and education. Alright guys, I'm just trying to get this last spot. I'm trying to find a good stopping point, but I can't. <laughs> I can't find a good stopping point yet. Hold up. Let me just do this little piece right here. I don't know how some of these guys will react to actually seeing a full nipple. So I may I may have to paint the nipples off camera. I feel bad that like our culture is so in in motherfucking mature that I can't paint breasts. It's crazy. All these beats are just uh some YouTube mixes, yeah. Lo-fi, lo-fi. 
fire and chill. What's this called? This is called Chill Hop Study Beats. Chill Study Beats number two, instrumentals in jazz hip hop. Chill Hop Study Beats. Because this is a male dominated society uh, structured by Western culture and Western ideology that uh, <laughs> worships a trinity of a father, a son, and a Holy Spirit with no female entity in there. So it's, it's really weird. It's a bunch of psychological, cultural uh, reasons why you can see men nipples and not women's nipples but it's only mostly in Western culture. But then you go to savage, uh, uncivilized cultures of, uh, you know, tribal systems in South America, the America, uh, North America, South America, and Africa, where, you know, women walk around topless and it's not a big thing. It's really not, you know, then when Europeans pick it up, they call it a nudist colony and they make it seem so wild and edgy but in other cultures, it's natural because <laughs> that's how God made me. Yo, Pharaoh, what's up? <laughs> Be the only white guy in Vegas bumping that. Yeah, this, um. Uh... Once again, cultural issues, man. Cultural issues, man. America is is a Western society, but it is culturally different from Europe, even though it's a European nation. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, man. forgot I was painting for a minute. You know what I'm saying? America makes such a big deal about this shit. And some, I mean, some European countries still struggle with Especially with the female body, especially uh, Arab, some Arab cultures. I mean, but that's just what it is, man. I don't feel like women should ever have to hide their hide themselves. You don't want to wear a bra? Don't wear a bra. I don't care. You don't want to shave your armpits? I don't give a fuck if you don't shave your armpits. So what? You want to breastfeed in public? Be my guest.
ain't gonna be able to do much more than that without removing the tape. And like I say, I don't know if I can trust you motherfuckers. Oh shit, yo. What the fuck? Yo, my neck got a fucking cramp in that bitch right now. Not from YouTube, I wouldn't get banned, but I'm streaming from my PS4, so I'm not sure if the PlayStation Network would would ban me. I already had this issue out with PlayStation. I mean, with uh, with YouTube, and they tried to shut me down once before, and I was like, "Whoa, you can't do that." But now I'm thinking, like, can can the uh, Sony Network shut me down? I don't know. some cool ass ideas and concepts yo about like some um like some hieroglyphs or something swear to god bro i seen this other artist he just posted a picture it had like a hieroglyphic background i was like what the fuck i gotta start when i get some shit like that man i gotta fucking hop right on that shit yo anthony yeah, when I get ideas now, like man, I gotta, I gotta really hop like right on it. I swear, yo, the shit I was thinking about, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly how he did it, but I was like, yo, that shit is fucking nice, yo. Damn, I would have thought of that shit. But as soon as they see women's nipples, they start making the most derogatory and explicit comments possible, especially it being a black female. So they got to add racial shit in there. And it's just like utterly, utterly childish and ridiculous. So I don't know.
immature as shit is what they are. That little afro face. That's old Bob Ross. Old Bob Ross too. some kind of ideas and I seen this one painting that was like damn that was really similar to what I was thinking about doing now I gotta dream up some other shit ah. but for all the new viewers uh, hit the like and subscribe button man so you can keep up with all my projects we're still working on this one still working on that one with the blue uh, with the turquoise circles I have uh, three other paintings that I need to get working on too, yo. But so I have tons of art coming up. I always stay with new projects. So uh yeah, subscribe to the channel so you can keep up, man. Yo, peace. Until next time.